sure how much, uh, as I tell you guys, you can get a huge amount of background, which is totally cool. But um, uh, so I want to introduce uh, the great Paul Edelman. So he'll be our, our host today. And yes, yes. Woo! So I'll let him explain uh, explain uh, the conservancy, et cetera. But it, it's it's another example of one of these um, uniquely sort of Californian approaches to things. So um, the the short short intro, the, the the one or two minute intro is um, uh, the there's a study that goes on, and, and as you guys probably know, most of our national parks. Uh, were birthed out of areas in the West where people weren't, right? So the classic Yellowstone, um, Yosemite, there might have been Native, Native American people there, but, but as far as there were, wasn't a big giant city in there, wasn't a bunch of industry, and then we, we set it aside because we hadn't sort of screwed it up massively, right? That's not how most of the national parks are, protected areas around the world. Most of the areas around the world, there's people living in those landscapes, innervated in those landscapes, and um, uh, uh, then we, we overlay the park after we have all these farming e efforts and fishing efforts and whatever the heck it is, right? So the Santa Monica, uh, so, the, so late, we're talking late 70s now, people are interested in, hey, maybe we should do some efforts to protect the Santa Monica Mountains here. Again, already was ranching operations, already were the, the, the nucleuses of these cities that were starting, nuclei. And um, uh, so we start a study and and that would become the Santa Monica National Recreation Area, right? So as that's happening, the people in the state are hearing this and saying, hey, they, they can't buy all the land. It's not gonna be a, a giant you know, square. It's gonna be a bit of an amalgamation of, of patchwork lands. Maybe we should do something to acquire whatever the, the feds either can't or won't acquire. Maybe we, as the state actor, can go in and sort of fill in some of those gaps, right? To, to again serving the the goal of of protection of natural resources, public access to natural resources, recreation, all of those associated things um, that we see in and around the coastal zone and elsewhere. And so, uh, so the Santa Monica Mountains uh, Conservancy was created initially as just like a two two year, right? Was it only two? I thought they, uh, there, there, there's some initial. Like here's a little Short bit of money. Time. Here's a little bit of money. Why don't you guys take this little dollop of money and buy some land and then kind of go away? And long story short, that first thing happened. Then it was like, oh my gosh, we should we should do more of this. And so that ultimately led to this current um, uh, joint powers authority thing, right? Which is representation from various levels of government and and others as uh, an ongoing entity that gets money from the state and sometimes things like traffic cameras and stuff, but, but mostly from the state and from bond measures and things like that to acquire land and manage land for uh, the good of all of us. And so that's the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy. We have, we have a, a sister organization, the Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority that does uh, the actual uh, like firefighting or, or, or that type of stuff. And, 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 um, and there's this deep partnership between these two organizations. But, um, but with that intro, uh, if you can imagine it's a challenge because we are a, so this is a public entity trying to acquire land obviously if some person that has a parcel of land knows you're trying to buy it he or she might jack the price up might do something to the land that might decrease the value to you whatever so it's a challenge to acquire land in a public spirit and in an open way um, that that is both strategic but yet also doesn't drive all the prices to a gazillion million dollars where we have to spend you know insane amounts of public money to acquire uh, land and 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 trails and things like that so um, so Paul is our head guru of planning and making sure that we're doing stuff strategically and not only that but because we work in such a such a, a complex area he also has to be up on things that people other than than our organization are doing so Hey, the county wants to put in a new housing development over here. Hey, there's this new, the city is doing this new wildfire control methodology, whatever. There's some new parking proposal for people going to the beach, whatever it is. And so, so um, we are, the, the, the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy is the entity that's charged with um, managing and, and being as efficacious with funds and as effective with conservation as we can in this zone. Started with the Santa Monica Mountains, hence the name, but we've since spread into many other areas. So we go all the way up to 
Um, obviously, the coastal zone is what we're, we care about most here today, but, but the, the footprint of this group goes all the way up to um, the Grapevine, goes down into Los Angeles, Biona Creek, um, San Gabriel. So, so Santa Monica is a, is a bit of a legacy name. It's really, this is, the, this is the heart of where we work, but it actually sprawls out into urban Los Angeles, San Fernando Valley, all that stuff. Antelope Valley. Antelope Valley. So, uh, yeah. so yeah, and then the, the last thing I'll ask Paul, I'll, I'll say by way of introduction, is normally when I um, bring you guys in, we typically go to the headquarters, which is a story in and of itself. And maybe he can tell us the story of that. But, but um, for folks that haven't been here, just as a quick explainer, this is a joint. So this is a national park facility where you're sitting. But this is actually a joint agency visitor center. So all the, the state, the feds, the locals, everybody that has protected areas in the Santa Monica's, this is our focal point to come interpret, um, explain to the public, uh, and things of that nature. So uh, with that introduction, uh, Paul Edelman. Hey, thank you guys. Uh, I guess I'm um, so happy to talk with you. I really want to get across, I don't know, what I want to do is inject in all of you just a push in the conservation movement and to whatever I can give to you today to help you on that pathway, great, whether it's in politics or in your work or that type of thing. So the Conservancy now has a, a thousand square miles in its turf, like Sean was saying. We're all over. The, uh, the coastal zone ends just a little before Mall and Highway there and so if you do anything on this property it's subject to the coastal act which is kind of interesting in that sense because it's five miles from the coast and um, a key thing about this property it just gives you a perfect introduction into how many players are working in the mountains to save land you're standing on a national park service piece that had to go to the national park service because we had to use obama funds bonds from in the recession and in order to use those funds to buy this land, it had to be National Park Service land. So we had to get permission from the state to transfer this to the Fed. And then to get to buy this whole ranch, which was which used to be um, was going to be a big university at one point, we had to cobble together money from the state, from the locals, from, and the, the Feds. And so State Parks owns a big piece of this. Another agency I work half time for, the Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority, owns the bulk a bulk of it and State Parks owns some pieces up there. So you can see a State Parks Ranger in here, you can see an MRCA Ranger, and I think some National Park Service Rangers right there too. Um, so just to give a quick sense of how I got to where I am, I, I went to UC Santa Cruz, I studied environmental studies, got out, kind of drifted a little bit through landscaping, ended up getting a job working for an environmental consulting firm in Orange County for a little over a year. I kind of got really sick of it because it was just uh, <laughs> the development machine. And But the skills I learned working for the consulting firm have just been phenomenal. And I transferred that and then I got, went and got a master's degree at Cal State LA. And my degree was doing grassland restoration in Malibu Creek State Park across the street here. And then doing that, somebody said, hey, do you want to come um, work for the Nature Conservancy? and do a one-year study on wildlife corridors connecting the mountain ranges from north of the 118, like from the 126 down south into the Santa Monica Mountains. And so I did that study, and the executive director of the uh, Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy said, hey, you want to work for the Conservancy? And that was in 1990. And so I've been doing this for 30 years, and pretty much as the chief ecologist. And so I work on land acquisition, we do restoration, I run a restoration crew based out of this nursery right here and grows their plants there. And I also, I'd say a combination of fighting developers, you know, work, you know, working in the entitlement process, writing comment letters to the county, to the cities, trying to say, hey, cut down the size of the project, don't do the project, make the project developer provide some um, money to maintain the lands that they set aside. Really anything you can do from the, the the current of development to make it work better ecologically and to get something out of it for the public so that it just doesn't go forward with no maintenance money, just gets ignored and uh, potentially um, hopefully you know save a canyon or two or maybe kill the thing and then, and then buy it two years later if possible. So it's a constant push to try and keep back the development footprint coming into the wilds uh, because think about it, 
how many parcels there are. If you just, I don't know if there's parcel lines on that map or not, but there's so many parcels in LA County, Ventura County, and every one of them is owned by somebody that wants to get get their money out of it. You know, occasionally you meet people who say, oh, you know, I'll just donate it for the tax write-off and I'll save it that way. But that's just a microcosm. And then, and then being in in um, near Hollywood too, you'd think with all the people living in Malibu and all that that we would get donations or whatever. But the private sector is just. Uh, it's it's pitiful what the private sector does in terms of helping save land. So it's a it's a it's it's us the other agencies and sometimes pockets of citizens that want to help and save land working together and, and and but ultimately it really boils down to either you have the money to buy it or you get enough of a political alliance with the, poli the local politicians to save it or it's a stalemate or you lose it. And uh, in some cases, sometimes developments get approved, but they're, they're, they don't really pencil out for various reasons, either because they, they require too much, um, what are called off-site improvements, like road improvements and things of that nature that make it not work in, the, in different economies. And sometimes, even if something gets approved, the uh, developers say, well, okay, we'll sell it if we can get a, a good enough appraised price. Um, one other question too, Sean was saying that we have to worry about jacking the prices up. It's not it's really the case. It's the case in terms of the developer's heads, or the landowner's heads, you know, even just a mom and pop owner. But ultimately we can only pay the appraised value um, done by a certain uh, class of appraiser. And that's the limit. And so, and so many times now, particularly with land values going up so high, that the um, landowner's expectations are, are that their property is worth a lot more than it really is. And the appraisal, based on comparable data of other sales, comes in, and it's just you know it is what it is, and we're stuck with that. We can't pay more than that, and there's a stalemate. And some of these times, they, some of these go on for for five, ten years sometimes without resolution. There's one case I'm working on now where this poor guy, a Korean War vet above Topanga Canyon, he's owned the property since 1960, and at the end of the you know, he bought it with some buddies after the end of the Korean War. And there's one little title clause on there that allows some other landowner next to, next to them to kind of jack them around unless he does exactly what they want to sign some document he should do. And so we've been trying to buy it for 29 years and we're getting kind of we're getting close. But so buying land is is tough. And uh, <laughs> occasionally you get freebies, occasionally you get victories. And my biggest thrill, the thing that I find the most rewarding is just to you know finally get a protected piece because it's you know it's once it's protected, it's protected. Some people will be critical and say, oh, hey, but you didn't get, you didn't get money to maintain it. And I'm of the school of, no, so what? So what? It's good if you can get the money to maintain it, but it's more important that it's saved because once you've got it, you've got it, you can build on it, and uh, it sets the tone. It gives people, other landowners, the idea to potentially participate in that process too. Uh, so it's, I, I'm, in essence, kind of a kind of rogue in my approach in that sense, <laughs> where I, saving the land is really what, what's up if you have to uh, break a rule or two here and there to get there. Sometimes that's what you got to do. And, uh, and last, I'll just kind of close with a couple things. One of the big issues is maintenance. Is how do you take care of public lands? The MRCA, which is our, the Joint Powers Authority with two Ventura County Park Districts and the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy the State Agency. That does all of our maintenance. Job advertisement. Yeah. Job advertisement. And the other person, uh, he moved, he worked and he moved on to work for the Army Corps of Engineers, issuing um, stream bed uh, permits. So he, he was great too. So I, lo I love you, I love your program <laughs> and, and the work that I've seen in the class. The class that makes me jealous of him in your classes. So, uh, how about, how about I, have a, I have a question? So can sure. you walk us through a couple stories? So one story might be that they might um, have heard of would be um, the Edge's effort to build um, his his studio recording thing. So so maybe you can walk them through as this, as one example of a high profile, but nevertheless an example of the kind of stuff that we engage. And I assume with. everyone knows who the Edge is. 
You too? You guys know who you two is? You guitarist? No, he, I don't know who that is. The U2 guitarist, David Evans, bought a piece of property with some other entities and different limited liability corporations above the Malibu Pier on the coast there. And it was a property that when I first started in 1990, I looked at it, we called it the Vernon property. You know, it was like these cliffs. There's no way anybody ever developed it. We even ended up getting a dedication of some property between it and the coast and thought, let alone anybody even walk to it. But he bought it and divided it. There were five parcels. We put each one in a different in an LLC so that they could be, in essence, separate entities going for permits and not considered as like one one entity going for a permit. So it looks smaller than it was. It would well, look... it, 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 what it was is it, you know, it's like a, uh, you can't, if you, if you have separate entities applying for a permit, a lot of rules don't apply to the individuals, where if they were clustered, that they would get slaughtered. So he was brilliant in that, so well, he ended up not being brilliant, but it looked like he was brilliant to come apply for five houses, all stair-stepped up this cliff area, you know, with a road that even in a four-wheel drive going downhill, you, you felt scared, and he was going to, I don't know, the road had like a, a thousand caissons in it in order to get up to two of the houses up above it. So it was a super challenging piece of property. The county had to approve it because they were uh, individual plot plans, and you know, that's kind of the way when private property laws are now, that you have your individual single family lot that you're not going too crazy. You picked on a really big parcel because people were all at least at least 10 to 20 acres each. That a lot of rules don't apply, particularly in, the, in a, above 10 acres in the county, LA County, you don't have to have lighting or sidewalks or drainage or anything like that. So he went forward, it looked like they were a, a, a machine that couldn't be stopped because of his wealth and he had hired all the consultants he wanted. And they hired, the, they hired these green designers who said, oh, every, all the houses we're building are super sustainable. And they had this green green seal of approval kind of thing, as right. if that made it they, okay. The most cliche landscape architect who was going to put in the perfect succulents with the, the perfect little emitter and everything was going to be perfect and the colors are going to be perfect. And the roof shape like this would mimic the mountains and, and all this stuff. And the, you know, everyone was just feasting off his money, all these consultants to go forward. Then he and so oh, you kind of brought up a sore subject too. <laughs> Unfortunately, my boss feared that the Coastal Commission would be uh, subject to his power and, and vote with him. And we, the, he, the Conservancy, entered into a draft deal with them to say, okay, we want to oppose your project if you contribute, um, get, us, get us some key trail easement alignments for the coastal slope trail which is the trail that runs along east-west along the mountains on the coastal side of the backbone trail so, that, so it's really a cool a cool thing and it was really impossible to get those without his money so there were some other things in the package like a big conservation easement and some land and some maintenance money and that type of thing and so let me let me just clarify so so the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy didn't say if he could build his house or not, right? So that's that's the, the county, the local jurisdiction. And then because he's in the coastal zone, they have to get approval uh, from the Coastal Commission, which I don't know how much you guys have heard about that yet, but, but it's sort of another level. And so we, as an entity that, that works in this area, um, can write a letter to the, to the Coastal Commission. So they, they could ignore our letter, but because of the work we do and the history of stuff, they tend to take our our concerns very seriously, and so um, we're, we're sister state agencies, right? And so and so what Paul's talking about another issue when we have things like coastal access with an agency, and that's a key part of your mission, access trails, that stuff's really really important, right? And so we've been we finally finished what's called the backbone trail that goes along the spine of the of the mountains here. It took forever, um, and there's a similar. Uh, hope to do a coastal trail that goes all the way the length of the state of California, right? In some areas... Well, this, this is this is interior. That's the, right. that's the coast walk. Okay, sorry. That's the coast walk. So, so these, you know, some areas, if we're in San Luis Obispo and it's all a ranch land or something, you could work a deal out with the Hearst Corporation or whomever and, and you can get that trail. But in this place where you guys own that property and she owns that property and he, it's, it's, it's incredibly difficult. So, that, so they were very, very smart and this is increasingly how some of these land use battles in the coastal zone in California are going, they figured out what, what these guys 
really want, right? We want this trail, we, we, and we can't connect the trail because people have private property at different you know, points in the trail, and we, and we can't force them, we can't take that land by eminent domain or anything. So what they said was essentially, if you yeah, guys- but you have to have money to back it up. Right. right. Yeah. If you guys, he didn't say what we have to say, but if, if you, if you uh, don't oppose, right? If you don't oppose this development, hey, maybe, maybe we could provide some money uh, for the design of this trail and maybe the acquisition of some parcels, n not on his property, but other things that we were really wanting. So very, very smart strategy, right? Is really going after something that the agency values. In some cases, it's, it's busing kids that, that can't af afford to get to a beach. Like, hey, I can provide money. That's not what this story is, but, but hey, well, I can provide money for you to get kids that can't otherwise get to the beach, right? So it starts to become a competing, you know, they're all good things and you have to make trade-offs. And so it led to a super contentious, I, I don't know what time we went home that night. Normally our meetings end at like 9.30 or 10 or something. And that one went to like 12.30 and it was, and normally we vote for something and everybody's like, yes, we're doing that. Or we have a discussion, then everybody comes to an agreement and yes, we do that. This was a, a very divided vote as to whether we should provide a, a, a letter saying, don't allow this development or do. And so it was, it was a, a very interesting challenge from a decision standpoint. And then, so the, I guess the Coastal Commission, God, it's getting kind of blurry, but it, 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 <laughs> it uh, at some point the commission. Oh, oh, let me say, but, but we would only get that, that benefit if his project went through. And no one sued. So just because we didn't the write the letter doesn't mean we automatically got it. So he would have to construct his houses. Sorry. Ultimately, to make a long story short, the commission approved something a lot less. Well, first time they he, they disapproved it because it didn't really meet the postal act. The, uh, it was really clear that the developer was uh, Edge was, and his partners were uh, pushing the, what the, the coastal act allowed. So they came back with something smaller that the coastal commission staff said okay to. The coastal commission. Uh, they approve it? No, they approved it. And then the Sierra, local Sierra Club chapter sued them. sued them and won. And they won on points that everyone was kind of miffed by. It wasn't your typical things that you would have thought, oh, they're going to win because of this. And the court said, no, you're, you're going back to square one. And so Edge, after spending millions on this project in many, many years, he wants to develop, go back to LA County and start with his plot plan new environmental work, whether it's a mitigated neck deck or maybe even an EIR. And then the crazy part too was the road to those parcels up above the Malibu Pier also went through the city of Malibu. And after, say, he had gotten through the Coastal Commission on the houses, he then had to go to the city of Malibu for a coastal development permit on the road with the city of Malibu being horribly hostile to it, all the people living around the road being horribly hostile to it, pretty much the whole world being horribly hostile to it. And uh, we being good guys just tried to do coastal development access like a, like a staircase from here to you down to the beach. <laughs> Literally, it's, it takes about a quarter of a million dollars worth of, engi of engineering and environmental fees to do that and then even build the thing. Another half a million dollars is what, 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 what we're at. And a lot of it has to do with the city of Malibu being... The city of Malibu. Being the city of Malibu, <laughs> whether it's whether it's they're anti-access or they want the development fees or they're just a bunch of bureaucrats. Um, it's torture getting, you know, it's the only time I'm ever sympathetic to developers is getting a coastal development permit. It's just torture, even if it's just for a public good for something that's almost no impact at all. A little staircase, you know, uh, in a place where, where currently there's just, you know, just a, you have to kill yourself, spraining your ankle going over the rocks. Um, and so now we're hoping maybe buy the Edge's property, but I think they're licking their wounds and who knows what they're going to do. Um, but getting back to the appraisal issue, the property has no entitlement. There was all that work he did, all the millions he spent, the hearings, and leery-eyed, and the horrible experiences we had. He's just back, he's just he's literally raw land now, with whatever kind of zone it has, and whatever kind of general plan amendment. There's a history behind it, but he didn't really add value until you get the entitlement. So if we did an appraisal, it's not going to appraise very much because look at he, 
he went up against the, the entitlement uh, machine and got thwarted. So it's basically raw land again. And that's why once you get a permit to build a house or to do whatever, it ups the value of the property so much. And you get the land subdivided or you get easements or anything like that. Which really, before I turn it over to you guys, that's kind of the whole game is just everyone needs in the mountains Things were subdivided in a crazy fashion. Sometimes parcels were subdivided without getting access. So there are a lot of lands in this mountain range, in the desert, in the Santa Susana Mountains, in the Simi Hills, that have, have poor access. It may look like it, that you have an, an access easement. Some of them go up a cliff, or they make a right-hand turn, and you know the, the county, the city, don't make right-hand turns or 90-degree turns on access roads because the fire, the fire department turn around. So it's, it gets into analyzing. What, really what's what's feasible on paper and then then you throw in the environmental issues like endangered species even just sensitive species even oak, oak tree protection ordinances cultural resources that rock behind you right there happens to be like i think one of two places that, that, that really have indian tobacco that the tribes here use used to grow it on that rock and this one archaeologist told me he once took one hit of it and he woke up an hour later. <laughs> That's some good stuff. And they, and they, and they, and they, and, but he can't find it anymore. But he has, this site was occupied right where you are right now. Uh, I think it was 13, 13 and a half thousand years ago. There was a uh, village here, right where right where we're sitting here. And this was sort of like one of the epicenters of it. It was huge, and uh, I, think, I think that that I don't know it too well, but I think that was the, kind of the main area right over there. So if any time you dig here, you just have to just be ultra careful and have a tribal member on, st on site and a, uh, uh, an archaeologist. Um, all right, I think time for questions. Anything yeah. more you want me to give background? Uh, maybe the only thing I'll just touch on is, again, that, that issue of... So I know this, I don't, we don't want to talk too much about the Coast Commission now because this is, this is something else, but um, it's important for you guys to realize that there's really two areas that drove the... the the petition that would become the the first thing the citizens voted on and then eventually would drive the the coastal act and that's sea ranch up north in malibu right here so these what people were doing in terms of development with the coast excluding people from being able to walk on the beach and stuff that's what inspired the, the coastal act in the first place so so malibu that that character has remained right and so one of our we want everybody to, the rich people should be able to walk on the beach, the poor folks should be able to walk on the beach, people with cars, people without cars, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and so it's a bit of a challenge because one of the things that we try to do, for example, is add places like this and places that are campgrounds, right? Malibu doesn't like that. They'd much rather put in a gazillion billion dollar hotel, little boutique hotel with some kind of avocado wrap, whatever the hell, right? <laughs> that that um, you have to pay 500 bucks a night for, right? They like that kind of, those kind of folks on average. The folks that don't pay much or, or pay virtually nothing to go camp, hmm, they're kind of a little weird, right? Yeah, and they're so, all arsonists. Yeah, they're all ar yeah, so, so they also claim, even though the fires that are started by people are all started by the wealthy kids' Of the wealthy folks' as kids that are up drinking at midnight, uh, illegally starting a fire, but nevertheless, we can't have any campgrounds because it's too dangerous. So, so this really does get into a, a really important debate that's coming more and more to the forefront in California, which is equitable distribution of our resources, right? And so, so Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, as we mentioned, works all the way up to the five and out. Um, to, to we have the Compton Rangers and uh, you know into LA and San Fernando Valley, but but our name is the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy. So there's this notion that oh, you guys work up in the wealthy, big land where all the movie stars and actors work, right? What about we need parks here in downtown LA, and we work on that too. But there's still this perception issue that that we're protecting public lands for the the wealthier folks or the folks that are more entitled. And the reality is we're trying to do everything, but the legacy of some of the land use here and some of the management policies of other agencies, not us, make that a challenge. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't shy away from it, but it does make it, it makes it challenging. One last thing, there, there back, there was, a, I don't know, it was a court case, when was Nolan Dolan? There were two court cases. Uh, 
20 years ago? Yeah, about 15 years ago. The whole process of exacting out trail easements from development, unless there was just incredible nexus, it went away. And so prior to those Nolan and Dolan uh, federal Supreme Court cases, the Coastal Commission was able to say, okay, if you want to put your McMansion in, give us a, a, a vertical access from PCH down to the beach and maybe a lateral access along the, the base of the house so people can go up and down the beach. And so there were a whole bunch of trail, pieces of trail easements up in the, up in the highlands that were, were, uh, had to be dedicated. And also uh, vertical access points going from Pacific Coast Highway down to the beach. So there aren't too many. So right now we've got the, either the MRCA and the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy now have got title to, I think it's nine of them we're working on now, where you can go through an interesting process called a public works project where you can bypass going to the city of Malibu for a coastal development permit. You can you can do your own environmental work and then go straight to the Coastal Commission, which is, that's that's what the Coastal Commission wants. They want public access, so. But it's a long process. You have to come up, you have to do incredible studies and you know, the, things change. Like for instance, the FEMA came out with new flood zone maps. And so all these surveys we did for uh, wave uprush studies to see you know, how the, the bottom of the stairs would, would get affected. I had to redo everything. And then, you know, then the state's lands commission comes up with new rules. And so as you're working on a big process to entitle all this public access at all these different points along the coast in Malibu, the, the, the goalposts move a little bit and you have to spend more money. And, so, and, and the fact that you have to get everything lined up to when you submit to, to do your EIR and then get through the EIR process and get sued by Malibu and all the people in Malibu get through the courts, then go to the Coastal Commission. Getting everything lined up and paying for it at the right time, it's just, it's just it's, it's really hard. It's super hard. Many cast, that's another one of the projects that my staff's working on is all these different, really varied access points. Some of them are uh, pieces along PCH where with the, with the sea level rise, what used to be a nice sandy beach now is just a lot of rocks, but it's 200 feet of rocks most of the time, but with some good sandy beach, but beautiful view access right from PCH that you could just step out of your car and go in. So you have to design something to make it accessible and durable and meets the city of Malibu's building standards versus some other ones where we've got some, some 10 foot wide trails that go down from PCH down these beautiful kind of jungle-like bluff areas with canyons that make you feel like you're in the middle of nowhere, but the terrain is horrible. So you have to do a suspension bridge, but you're stuck You're stuck within that. You have to do the construction within that 10 feet. And one of them happens to end right where a little, a little, a small little drainage makes a hook and comes and makes a, a, a little, tiny little lagoon right where the, stair, the trail would come down. And it turns out even with the, the Coastal Commission wanting to do the public access, you can't have public access that goes through a little teeny lagoon like that. I mean, it's the, it's the size of two picnic tables, and there's no way around it. So we have to abandon it. We could, we could really get people to like this far from the sand. Nope. Um, so that's that's the kind of the, the range of access points. When I first mentioned to you, using this example, the one where we did, it's not in that process. We we do have a coastal development permit from Malibu. Now we're finding that it's. Six hundred thousand dollars for a staircase with I think nineteen steps and one one, uh, <laughs> one uh, what do you call it landing to make a turn. Okay, time for your questions. Questions.